Hello, and welcome back to another Discovery Review episode 6. Dang it, I remember to check the title, not the number. Stormy Weather. Where today, for the intro, uh, I want to pose a question, which I thought of as I was setting up my equipment. Now, of course, only being, well, for me, five episodes in, I haven't seen the sixth one. Is Discovery Season 4, quality-wise, the next generation season one. Now I'd like to start that with a huge disclaimer and that I actually quite like season one of the next generation. I think I'm a lot more positive than most people. I don't believe there is any first two seasons of any show, small caveat, that uh, should be skipped for Star Trek. The exception actually being Discovery, absolutely. The first two seasons are absolute trash. But I actually have the episode count in front of me and I think I mentioned I've seen um, all of those episodes pretty recently. It's a lot of stuff that like, when you think of Next Generation episodes, you're never really like, oh, that one, you know, there, there's none of those greats in season one. And similarly, trying not to look at the um, episodes on screen, like, I, I know what's happened in season four, but I think the only episode I could really say is the, there was the Quat Malat episode. And in part, that's because I saw it when I looked at the episode title on my other monitor. But like, there's not really any, like, what have we had? You've had the Crashed Shuttle episode. I mean, you've had, I guess the first two were kind of like the big serialized plot and, and the Quatma lot. That's four. I think I'm actually gonna have to look. Oh, no, the Prisoner episode. Yeah. Editing Nathan here. And to further prove my point, I've actually realized I got it wrong when I said that. I completely forgot about the They Go Into the Anomaly episode, episode two. You actually have episode one, you know, your main plot. You have Go Into the Anomaly, Aquatmalot, Crash Shuttle, and then Prisoners. And none of those are, like, the Star Trek episodes. I highly praised the first episode, and especially the stuff with Quajon, but... It's kind of in a different context because it's within that serialized, greater serialized story. But if you look at the next generation, I think what I'm really going to draw the comparison because we don't have much time, that prisoner episode, which was the last one? Yes, the examples where uh, in my description and stuff in the comments, I think I made a lot of jokes about this, but never mentioned it in the video where the examples kind of tries to be a morally episode um, with this justice system of the examples. I can't remember what it's called. I'll just call it the example system or the example, something like that. I'm going to highlight that to Justice, which is the Edo planet, the one where the people of Baywatch want to execute Wesley Crusher for stepping on the grash, <laughs> the grash, that planet, where in the examples, basically what we told this justice system, the justification for it was we got it from the Orions. It's been really effective. That is the only defense or justification for that system that we've got. And I think as I went quite in depth in my last review, that doesn't really make any sense the more that you think about it, especially even after the video, thinking if they know for a fact, I'm pretty sure they said they picked six specific examples to serve a life sentence. So if they're examples and there are six of them, well, then you probably know they exist because they're going to be examples, even though it looks like they're very well hidden. But, but anyway, either you know they exist, you know there are six, and so any crime you commit won't be a life sentence because there's no open jail cell, or you don't know if they're still alive, therefore they are not examples because you can't see or interact with them in any way, and at that point it's just the normal deterrent of life imprisonment or even the death penalty, and our society, or rather my society, has both of those. Most societies have a life sentence, I think, and people still commit crimes. I'm going to also put that to justice, where it was kind of trying to be a, uh, a philosophy. Um, the whole point was there can be no justice if laws are absolute. And it was fairly direct delivery. Again, there wasn't any discussion on the Edo system other than it works. And I think I also mentioned this as in my last video, uh, watching that now a little bit older than the last time I went through Next Generation, that just seems like such a corruptible system where the cops choose one zone where crime is punished and only they know about that zone. Like, not only is that so corruptible, but statistically, on the planet scale, the one zone you are in is probably not going to be the zone that is being policed, unless these zones are literally more than half the planet, but that's impossible, because that still means there's another zone that's less than half the planet. But 
compare that to the Voyager episode, Death Wish, um, which is one of the very few Q episodes that does not have Q in the title. It's where the other Q um, wants to die, but the Q won't allow it, right? And so I'm not going to put it forth as like an amazing philosophical debate. I haven't seen it in ages. But they actually sit down and Q goes, this is why we shouldn't put him to death. But most importantly, the other Q goes, this is why I want to die and want to be put to death. I suppose it's more an assisted suicide than a death penalty episode, but you actually examine both arguments. Most of the audience is probably going to have an opinion one way or the other, and it's, it's actually a moral discussion as opposed to TNG season one. A lot of episodes do this, by the way, not just Justice. I, I got a lot of sense where it was like kind of examining one side of the argument and it just making a light point. Like there can be no justice if laws are absolute. That's not really like a super high-end discussion compared to, um, well, compare that to Deep Space Nine's In the Pale Moonlight. At what point is, like, the price too high, essentially, for war? How far would you go? Or Enterprise Season 3 did a fantastic job of being serialized and examining those philosophical things and discussing them in both sides. The example being the trip wants revenge, but the general no for the sake of Earth, like, it's right to actually work with these people and make things better. You know, that sort of general plotline. And so Discovery has had a lot of, they're trying, I think I've said before, they're trying Star Trek stuff, and that's kind of where, what early TNG would have been, season one, maybe two, of, um, you know, we're trying those Star Trek things, you're just pretty surface level. Like, if this is Chris Chibnall's Doctor Who, Discovery is kind of like above here. You're doing more than saying racism is bad, but you're not actually analyzing, like, why does racism show up? How do we combat racism? Anything like that, you know, which is maybe what later Star Treks would have been up there, your late TNG or your Deep Space Nine. Especially late Deep Space Nine is like way, it's out of the camera frame. But yeah, I posit that question. Uh, maybe some people discuss it in the comments. But quality-wise, and particularly from that lens, because I know some people really hate early TNG, is Discovery Season 4 the next generation Season 1 of Discovery? With the small caveat that Discovery's probably had some higher highs than early TNG, but I think that's really because they have the character development of, like, mid-TNG, because with the main characters, yes, yeah, specifically the main characters, not the bridge crew, but the main characters, you know, they've got quite a bit of development. They've got four seasons of development, three or four seasons. So there is my question. And then let's get into episode six, Stormy Weather. I really should do that more stealthily. Let's get into the review. Oh, and Merry Christmas for those celebrating. That's that's this week in a few days. I haven't forgotten. Let's see. Most obviously Voyager's The Void. Uh, season 5, I'm pretty sure, where they go into the region of space where there's absolutely nothing, basically, between the arms of our galaxies. Uh, there's the Next Generation episode. Admittedly, I'd have to look up the name because I've just seen it. Season 2 of um, the Galen, I think it is, where they go into essentially a void and nothing of space. And it's that big head that experiments on them it's the uh black red shirt that's got the really dramatic death <laughs> yeah it's like rocking on you know he is uh, there's the tass episode where the kirk ship the enterprise and then a klingon ship gets sucked into this weird dimension -y thing that drains all of their energy and then as i was saying that one i, I want to say voyager has a really similar episode maybe i'm just inventing that but i said four when i was doing my tweet originally and then when they talked about, um, you know, making subspace toxic, it of course reminded me of the season two Discovery, actually season one Discovery plot line of the old uh, ISS Chiron and poisoning the mycelial network, which is to say that before the title sequence aired, I had already compared this to five episodes of Star Trek, even if I don't remember what that fourth one was exactly. And yes, this is season one of The Next Generation, because that was a pretty good episode, you know, not great because i'll get into it not bad at all but i'm about to spend what is probably way too long over an hour of my life going over all of the constant problems in this episode from the real tiny ones to just start breaking the ship go forward 
No, what really got me actually was, um, it's the Nagayam one. I'm gonna look it up. Hang on. Where Silence Has Lee, Season 2, Episode 2. Um, a lot of what they did in The Next Generation, I literally watched this episode a few days ago, to, like, try and figure out where they were in the nothingness was exactly what a lot of the Discovery stuff did. And, you know, Star Trek is big. It's 800-something episodes long, and there are always gonna be, you know, the minor themes you can connect that kind of make it Star Trek. I mentioned you had the crash shuttle episode recently you know you can kind of say that most episodes are going to in some way copy star trek i'm going to argue that is a joke before when i was doing with my partner the um ordville review podcast they did we never ended up releasing it i had a joke of subtitling every episode of the podcast is the star trek episode it was most similar to and i still enjoy the orville as being very unique and also down here you've got doctor who which admittedly not under Chibnall, but is still producing, you know, original stories that aren't really what we've seen before. It, like, before the title sequence, if you can come up with four or five episodes that relate to this one, you probably should come up with a different different topic, you know? Where do I be in? I, I was actually gonna say I'm glad it's kind of serialized. This was actually more of an episodic. They kind of disguised an episodic episode as a serialized thing. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy with how Discovery is handing their serialization it, uh, in this season. It's a lot like Enterprise Season 3 from memory. If they keep this balance of serialization in the rest of their shows, I'm going to be very happy. I don't know how you do it for Picard, thinking about it. Picard probably would need to be a very, a very pure serialized story. But we'll see if I'm proven wrong. They kind of brought up the scar of the DMA. Um, it, it's a really minor gripe, but they brought up the scar of the DMA. Just like that, they kind of mentioned the scar, whatever it left behind. I don't think they referenced that in the last episode. If they did and I'm not remembering, it's my bad. Like a really minor gripe. Might have had a nice scene of like detecting the scar, but... I, I don't know, that might have been in the last episode. Oh no, but I, I did like um The Great Barrier. I really like that being referenced. I know it's has a book. I think it's a book series that develop goes into the origins of the Great Barrier. Um which if you don't know, it's like a TOS episode. Um where no man has gone before. I think that's actually the name of the episode. Not to be confused with the next generation episode of the same name. Of uh, a great literally a great barrier around our galaxy. It pops up maybe two or three more times because there are extra galactic aliens in the TOS. Cat Spa comes to mind is one of them. And um, there's one where the people have belts that turn other people into salt. <laughs> Weird episode, yeah. Star Trek V, the one we don't speak of, also has the Great Barrier. So it's kind of like a donut shape. So like the, the middle of the galaxy is also protected by it. Since then, I don't think the Great Barrier has actually come up ever maybe maybe it's come up sporadically i feel like it might have been mentioned some other time in modern um but yeah it's a pretty big deal that that's like never been addressed and i've actually just remembered why i think it's come up it's with picard and um the extra galactic synth federation i think i theorized so there's theorization that maybe the great barriers to keep them out but yeah i like that it's mentioned i've been interested if the extra galactic species is one we're aware of but I wonder if they're doing what people have said Star Trek should do a lot, and then what actually people have said refuted is, no, that's dumb, is basically, I believe it's Mass Effect Andromeda has this plot. And actually, Picard did like stealing from Mass Effect. Generally, the setup is there's a wormhole or special propulsion. There's something that connects uh, the Milky Way to another galaxy, right? And so it's basically... It's almost like a cold reset, like it's still the Star Trek world, but the Federation's exploring this new galaxy, so kind of Voyager-esque, like the, you can't get help from the Federation. I mean, you can, there's the wormhole, maybe it, it goes away or something, but basically it's setting, it's setting a blank map for the Star Trek universe without rebooting and getting rid of everything we love. I wonder if that's kind of where this is leading to, where we're going to deal with this other, you know, extragalactic species, but then maybe we'll explore that other galaxy a bit and give the writers time to flesh some species out. Because I'll admit, the Alpha Quadrant is rather crowded around the Federation and rather full. Like, there are plenty of bits of our galaxy you can explore, but... I, I really liked going through the next generation in Deep Space Nine the first time, and to a lesser extent Voyager being in the Delta Quadrant, but just fleshing out that map and developing it, you know, but by the end of Deep 
Space Nine, you, you know, you got the Romulans on top, the Klingons at the bottom, and then there's kind of the other bit, you know, the, the Beta Quadrant that was largely the unexplored space. But by the end of Deep Space Nine, you've got kind of the Cadassians are there, the Ferengi, the Bajorans, and there's still an unexplored area, but it's kind of like really small, and we've heard of a lot of the races there anyway. Like, there can't be some big empire we've ne never heard of. That just wouldn't make any sense. Like, in the hundreds of years we've been exploring, neither the Federation or the Klingons or the Cardassians have become aware of the secret empire. And I've seen the Tholians down there in, like, kind of this empty part of the map a lot. I wouldn't mind getting to know a few new species, like we did with Deep Space Nine. Again, I loved getting to know the Cardassians, Bajorans, and Ferengi, and just, it was a world. And, like, a little part of a world, though, that we really got to know, and I like that. And so, yeah, I'd be interested if that's the direction they take. Small note here, editing Nathan is going to add with their far more raspier voice you're going to see me gain, is that if you add the Romulan Empire to the Federation's territory, which you already have with Navarre, you add the Klingons, who you've kind of added in an alternate timeline through the Temple Cold War, and then you add the Cardassian and Ferengi territory, which again, we haven't confirmed they're in the Federation, but it's been kind of implied or suggested. You've actually made the edge of Federation territory the edge of known space. So you've already kind of done this reset. You can just push on those boundaries and see what lies beyond the Romulans, Klingons, and Cardassians. And you've probably boarded the Tholians now. So yeah, you don't actually need the other galaxies to do this, but it'd still be interested to see Discovery actually get into that and some episodic stuff rather than the serialized storytelling. But I, I will, I will get into the scene by scene now and just see where the problems take me. Let's start off with Book, who I kind of, it's one of those scenes I watch and I have a back and forth with myself of, well, this is a problem. Well, you know, this could explain it. Yeah, well, first off, he wants to go out there and try and find the people, right? He has a ship. Like, he can go do that. Um, now, of course, the counter is, well, it doesn't have a spore drive, you know, he can't do it very well. Fine. But his argument is like, we should just jump out there to unexplored space. Feder like, Face Federation hasn't explored. You realize that's a lot. If the camera is the galaxy right now, right? This entire camera frame represents all the space in the galaxy, right? The little tongue on this 3D printed boo I have down here is about what the space known to the Federation looks like. There's a lot of non-Federation space, and now knowing that it comes from outside the galaxy, which admittably is not something that you would assume, knowing the Great Barrier is a thing. Like, I get he's grief-stricken and stuff, but you think Burnham, in part of her objections, would come up with like, we should at least check to like get a lead, other than picking a random space that's not in this small red tongue, and seeing if like, the maker of the DMA happens to be there. Also, I found it find funny when Michael's dad was on this scene. I'm pretty sure it's Michael's dad, because I legitimately did not recognize him. And I think it looks like it's with his mom, actually. But, uh, Burnham's mom. But bald, beard, like, I assume that's her dad. Also, Amanda is not on that tree. But that time Saru asked Burnham to euthanize him is. Um, so I'm glad she took a picture of that happy moment. This scene made me realize that Grey is literally the sole non-commissioned officer on Discovery, Asterix, where uh, even there's no bar staff, which, yeah, I, I could, I could have gotten an argument with myself of, like, why is there no bar staff? I'm like, well, why do you actually need a bar staff? Even 10 forward could run itself. Like, I guess you need cleaning staff. Well, then Discovery could probably clean itself. I mean, according to the technical manual, the Enterprise, D could do it. <laughs> it's, again, a back and forth, but yeah. Um, the exception is Booker, but of course everyone treats Booker like he can go anywhere for some reason. And I think I saw a kind of someone try and argue against that on Reddit the other day recently, where Book is one of two people in the universe who can pilot the Spore Drive, which is a good point, but also he's the sole witness of the destruction of Kajon, and Again, people just kind of feel bad for him. There is the general Federation out attitude of, yeah, do whatever you want. Like, I still think Book probably has a little too much access to everything, but it's weird. We've never had a situation like that where, functionally, Grey is the sole civilian on Discovery. And so whenever stuff like this happens, he's just like, well, I guess I'm doing it myself. Love that bar still. I would like to thank whoever wrote this script for... Finally acknowledging that these view screens should not be windows is Michael Burnham clearly gives the order, put the view up. And Awu looks at her, 
Like, that is the view. I'm like, yeah, of course it's the view. It's a fucking window. <laughs> wow, I got, I got angry at that. But um, yeah, I guess maybe she could have said like the view from behind. But it's a window in Discovery. Like, that is the view. And it really bothers me that everyone's like, oh, well, clearly our sensors not aren't working. It's not that there's nothing out there. And I kind of think that's actually what the show was saying. And it was weird. Now, I'll concede that in normal space, I, not a physicist, but I'm pretty sure there is actually always gonna be something. Even if you can somehow filter out the cosmic background radiation and all heat sources, and even like the ship itself and literally all external stimulus is just removed somehow magically right i'm pretty sure that there's like background quantum field oscillations and maybe virtual no i'm not gonna get into it because i don't really know but i'm pretty sure that's a thing like the background quantum field fluctuations that you could detect i think so i'll give them that but the point is they're in a different layer of subspace. Essentially, it's like another universe where the rules are completely different. In theory, I mean, there are there infinite layers of subspace? I think there might be. Or at the very least, there's like thousands that we know of. And we know of some that are like completely different. And so why can there not be a layer of subspace that's literally just nothing that stuff from our universe can happen to exist in unless of course again the external sensors were actually being affected but i feel like that should be easy to test because surely the external sensors if positioned correctly could detect the outside of the ship there's also the bit i'm jumping ahead i mean i know but where amzora detects something outside the hull which means her external sensors are working but it doesn't right? Because if it's sitting on the hull, surely there'd be internal sensors that can detect when something is on the hull. In fact, we actually see when they send out a dot, um, we see a camera of the dot leaving the ship, like going away from the ship. Even though Burnham's order is put the dot on screen, I'll assume that that automatically includes some sort of tracking camera. Are you telling me that was an internal sensor, just a camera on a tripod pointing out a window or something? Like, no, the external sensors are working. It's just there's nothing to sense. I did find the whole thing with the light weird. Like, at first I didn't get what Detmer was trying to explain. But then when it was, um, they'd use the time difference to see how fast the rim of whatever destroyed the dot is moving. They made a lot of jumps as well. For one, they assumed that it was actually something closing in on them. Which doesn't actually really make sense considering how this episode ended up working out like with them going backwards and still entering the thing so is, th is this layer of subspace an entire universe of dissolvey stuff but there's like an empty circle they happened to land in that started closing when they landed in it but yeah for one it assumed that it was a thing that was moving towards them as opposed to maybe like a random sphere like the ones in the expanse just drifting around it also assumed that it completely encircled them perfectly so that, for example, they couldn't just reverse forever and get away from this thing. They also assumed it was traveling at a constant rate, I guess, which is a problem. They also assumed it was actually a physically something, rather than some sort of tied proximity to the ship that caused the dot to dissipate. There's also the possibility it's an intelligence, like a Nagin, which I'm pretty sure was the guy's name from the Next Generation episode that's just getting rid of these things at will. Like... For scientists who specialize in the unknown and the new and the strange, they really skipped a lot of steps of their scientific process. And that's just the stuff on my head, off the top of my head. Like, you know, it's a lot of the scientific process being skipped here. If as a writer you wanted to prove that this was in fact the case, what we're observing here, you could have them fire their phasers in a 360 and then another 360 and go, okay, we're encapsulated in a sphere that is in fact slowly encroaching on us and I can detect that because I can detect the distant trunk uh, in the time it took us to do that 360 360. I don't really understand Zora as a computer so I'm willing to let a good amount slide. For example how this game played against a human component could actually make up for the sensory input of the entire you know every single external sensor array on this ship. How somehow removing senses could actually be overwhelming 
you think the problem Zora would be having is sensory deprivation, like the exact opposite problem of what she's describing, but exactly what is happening on Discovery. I'd also probably think that it wouldn't really be an issue. Like, if you chopped off my arm, I'm not gonna suddenly notice the other parts of my body more. Like, am I? But I'll let it slide to some weird emotional thing. She's not really a computer, she's in person anymore, right? Is this the part where I should discuss that Sora should absolutely be removed immediately from Discovery for being an endanger to everything and an impairment to every mission everywhere. In this mission, she was completely incapable of doing her job to emotional problems. Basically, I'll skip to the conclusion. Zora needs to go to the Academy. <laughs> Zora is not a Starfleet officer, and she is being given responsibilities above and beyond that of a captain. And, like Tilly, she is not able to handle it emotionally, because she literally has no emotional competency. Functionally, she is a child. Like, yes, an incredibly intelligent child who can think incredibly fast, with zero emotional capability or skills. Remember how they sent Data to the Academy for a full, you know, however many years that you have to study for the Academy, and then he spent several years at each of the positions just getting promoted because he was a new form of life. And just because he happens to be incredibly intelligent doesn't mean he can't skip the Starfleet officer training. And Zora is arguably even more. Well, no, that's not fair. She is in even more need of that training than Data was because Data had no emotion. In theory, you probably could have given Data the manual and sent him to serve on a ship. That probably would have been good enough. But Sora actually had uh, emotions. And like any other officer, needs to be trained to how to deal with them and grow accustomed to them and probably do some time at some low-level work gaining experience before she is literally more responsible for the crew than a captain. Like, imagine if you were a Starfleet cadet or something, and they just randomly halfway through your training were like, you know what, you're real good, let's make you an ensign. And then a year later, we're like, you know what, you're the first officer, and also you're in command now, because the captain is gone. Like, you would not live with that. You might even go join the academy soon after, because you're way over your head and can't handle it. And now you think you just can't do it. Even though you probably could have if you spent more time- Yes, can you tell I'm talking about Tilly? But yeah, I really hope it gets addressed that Zora is a massive liability to Discovery right now. Like, I'm not saying killer, of course. Discovery- uh, Zora's a life form now. Zora is clearly sentient and emotionally aware. Like, Zora's a life form. But she can't be in charge of Discovery. And it was nice, we finally got- I think it's our last- The last bit of the title we didn't know about is the- you know, the open brackets, the whoop, boom. Yeah, you know what, you'll know it. Just watch the title sequence. It's Zora. So I'm assuming Zora's development is a major part of this, this series. Sorry, this season. I'm confusing it with Doctor Who. Because otherwise she wouldn't be in the intro. So I think we're getting way more development on Zora. Uh, which is also part of why I'm letting it a lot of things slide with how Zora works. Because we just haven't established it yet. It's like when Data got drunk in season one of The Next Generation. It's like, oh, okay, I guess Data can get drunk. Like, we don't know anything about him, sure. And then a few episodes later, he mentioned how he can't actually get drunk due to alcohol, but early TNG. I don't really get um, Book's dad. Like, narratively or as a character? Because sure, we don't know a lot about Quajonians. Qua I think they're just called Quajon. And this is presumably some figment of Book's imagination and like the memories of his dad, so probably a little over the top. But really, he kind of just felt like I was watching a Klingon story. I have like all the honor and hunting and warrior-y stuff, and it doesn't seem like anything we've seen about the Quajon culture at all. It just didn't really gel. But he felt like he was holding on to some pretty ancient beliefs as well, and rather traditional. There's also later in the episode the bit where he's like, oh, it wasn't me, the Orion chain forced me to do it and you gotta love when shows star trek is not a stranger to it try and give a character's forgiveness or moral justification through a figment of someone else's imagination that is not that actual character we had it with i uh, was it the quat malad episode where book saw his nephew turn his head in a memory which he could absolutely have no memory of the other one that comes to mind is picard where you had a data basically forgive Picard for Data's death, but 
that was a version of data that was before that death. So it was not the same data that Picard sacrificed himself for, or some sort of weird simulation. Like, again, Picard was very unclear and very bad. Both have big problems. I can imagine Hitler saying, man, guys, I'm sorry for the Holocaust. That doesn't mean that Hitler is sorry for the Holocaust. I will say, though, massive, massive, massive props that someone actually mentioned their symptoms for once. Pook's like, yeah, I saw my dad. Like, is this a problem? You know, I, I'm hallucinating. I, I think Star Trek's actually pretty good at that in general. Not Discovery. Of course, you had Tilly with whatever her dead friend was. Very similar situation as well. But I, I've always seen it cited actually is part of the professionalism thing. Again, this episode had problems with professionalism later on. I'll address them now. Where the, the big problem was Uwu. Who, again, I don't remember how to say her name, but I know it's spelled Uwu, and it's pretty similar to Uwu. <laughs> but she kind of had the breakdown, like, no, let me do this thing after a captain told her not to. And like, I could pass it from an ensign in a stressful situation. She's literally a commander. She is the highest possible rank you can achieve without being a captain. And sure, she had some personal trauma in the past. Are you telling me she got to the rank of commander, is a bridge officer, went through a war, went through everything she's done and everything she must have done off screen to get to the point of commander, and not at some point had the problem of, I wish I could do something, but I can't because my job is here and not over there doing something? And then to rub salt in the wound as well. Like, when they're actually evacuating because they need the power, oh, we'll get to that. She's like, no, actually, I'm going to stop and apologize to you, Saru, during this crisis rather than afterwards. Like, from her perspective, it would literally take zero time between entering the transporter buffer and leaving. She is not saving time by doing this now. She is actively endangering the mission. And, as I'll point out, Discovery decided it just wasn't going to move forward until everyone was in the transporter buffer. And so she was actively delaying the time and putting everyone's lives at risk by not entering the transporter buffer. That's not her fault. That's the fault of a stupid captain who won't start moving the ship forward immediately. But it, <laughs> no, we'll get, we'll get to that one. I'm starting to get angry. Today we've learned that it is not Federation policy that... While you are going to close down a section, you know you're going to set the emergency transports due to a hull breach, and we know they know, because Zora started a countdown, that it is not policy to engage a transporter lock on all personnel within the area that is going to be enclosed and then ejected into space, and then beam them out of that area. And in fact, after they've been injected, it's not policy to lock on. I mean, to be fair, it would have been really hard to lock on. There's a lot of stuff outside of Discovery, a lot of sensor noise. Like, there's no way you could have detected a person in the literal absence of everything, including background radiation and quantum field fluctuations. You could not have locked onto someone wearing a comm badge. How long does a transporter lock on take in TNG 800 years ago? Like, Boop, 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 all done, Commander. And then Zora counted from three, right? I'm a programmer. Like, you, when you program these things, you have to, like, not just by being a good programmer, to actually think, how do I program this? You have to go through the scenarios of what if it's blocked? What if it's yada, yada, yada? And one of the scenarios that comes up is unquestionably, what if there are people in there? And at what point do we make the cutoff to close the thing. And you don't think, hang on, every- wait, he's wearing a badge! He's wearing a teleport badge! And do you know how long that lock-on takes? Boop boop, done. Like, literally, no, I'm gonna let it play. Boop, boop, in the- done. in that time, in that, like, half a second between him hitting the force field and being ejected, he could boop boop, and then he could just be in sick bay. Like, why does he even running? Why, why doesn't the computer auto-transport them? They literally always have a constant transporter lock in a personal transport. And now, you might say the reason is because Zora is the computer. And so, Zora has to actively make that active decision. And if that's the case, that makes Zora even more of an active liability and risk to her crew and any mission Discovery is sent on, which might I point out, being the sole ship with a spore drive and having to leave the galaxy soon, is the most important ship 
in the entire galaxy at this point. <laughs> I was mad before I remembered they were all wearing transporter badges. You might say you can't transport for shields, but I counter that with the fact that twice in Discovery, we actually have seen them transport through shields. There was once that final battle with Asira, and actually I think again it was another time with the Emerald Chain. I will also point out that there are not shields on either side of this wall, and the reason you cannot beam through shields is because basically the transporter beam will be deflected, but if you know the shield frequency, then you can beam through shields, and don't try and tell me that Discovery does not know the shield frequency of the shields Discovery just raised. Oh, and then for the following scene, let me go through the conversation. There's a, a part of the ship is about to be decompressed. Gray, Zora, you need to tell the captain. Zora tells the captain. Two scenes later. In fact, there's just one scene in between. Wait, Zora, you can use your external shields? I need to tell the captain. Why can't Zora do it? In fact, when Gray does go to the bridge, I get, he doesn't use a comm. Like, you know, he doesn't try and use a comm, he actually goes to the bridge. Wait, does Grey not get a teleport? <laughs> anyway, like, when Grey does actually go to the bridge, Zora's the one who ends up explaining things. <laughs> Time is of the essence, is it not? I think Grey knows this. Well, why not have Zora communicate this information? Even if you want to go to the bridge anyway, why not tell Zora to tell the captain and then run up to the bridge? And then as Zora, why don't you go, hang on Grey, I'll tell the captain. Oh, he ran off, he didn't hear even though you can literally communicate with him anywhere, why don't I just tell the captain anyway, so she's prepared when Grey shows up. Oh, then you have this scene, which is great, where Book starts arguing with a figment of his imagination, and then we see the two doctors, one of which being the ship's psychologist, ship's counselor, turn around, look at him, and go, this is concerning, should we intervene? And then they just let Book keep on arguing with this figment of his imagination, who is not real, Will they just get their work on if they wait for him to finish and like approach them? I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that's not good practice. If you want Book to argue with his dad, fine. Just make him be alone for the scene. Or or on his way to sick bay. Empty corridor, ships on red alert, right? He's just arguing on the way to sick bay, and then he gets there after the argument, or the people cut him off. Like he Season one of TNG. Okay, I want to make sure we're all perfectly clear on this. They find a way out, right? But then realize it's going to take too long to get there. They don't immediately start going, well, Detmer, get us on their way. Everyone, let's try and think of a way to extend our time. They go, well, I guess we're dead. No, there's not even a point in trying because we don't got enough time. And even then, once they then have a plan, which they come up with immediately, D Captain does go, Detmer, get us on their way. Everyone, get in the transporter buffers. She waits the good 10 minutes for everyone to get in the transporter buffer, which they all dilly-dally at doing, as we've discussed. And then, only then, when she's sitting on the bridge all comfortable, does she start the ship moving. Now, I'm not sure if Discovery has an autopilot or not. I would be very surprised if it doesn't, given Bookship does, and your computer's sentient. But even if it doesn't, I think Zora's probably capable in flying in a straight line for, like, 10 minutes. Secondly, what did Burnham actually do, like, other than nearly get herself killed? Well, actually, there you go. It did have a autopilot. Zora flew the ship. Because, like, a captain never leaves her ship. Well, what about Archer, who put himself under to go through the anomaly where they would all die if they were alive and left Phlox conscious to run the ship? Like, what's the difference here? More lives are at stake. When is a captain goes down with her ship ever been a part of Star Trek? Like, yes, if one person has to stay behind to save everyone else, it's gonna be a captain. That's very, very, very different to there's literally no reason I have to be on the bridge. If I am on the bridge, I will literally do nothing except put myself at risk. There is an easy way for me to protect myself that the entire rest of the crew is doing. I'm going to stay on the bridge. If anything, it's being a worse captain because it's leaving Discovery before an extremely important mission in the potential situation of having her captain dead 
at a point where I'm pretty sure it doesn't have a first officer. Saru is acting as the first officer. I'm not sure he's actually been given that appointment officially. And yeah, he'd probably take over. But now you're putting the head of state, a state, well not the head, but a head of state in the position of captain, which has its own problems and risks to Kaminar. It's because we needed to see someone on the bridge for that shot, isn't it? Like, that's the reason. Oh, and that was my other problem is the bridge exceeded the safety parameters, the temperature parameters specifically for an EVA suit. Bearing in mind that this is an EVA suit a thousand years in advance of the same EVA suit that Michael Burnham threw around a sun in the very first episode of Discovery. Now, I know radiation isn't the best. Um, it's as far as like heat transfer radiation, that kind of radiation. But I also know that once the sun comes out, like our spaceships, which this spacesuit is serving as, get very hot very fast. Like radiation, radiating heat is actually one of the primary concerns and biggest problems of like any spacecraft. Here's the biggest problem. They spend a good like five, ten minutes evacuating everyone. Maintaining life support is gonna cost like basically no energy, right? Assuming you've already got like perfect oxygen and your room temperature, which is what Discovery would be at having been running with life support for like years, presumably. The power they'd gain across this journey is basically nothing, right? Again, we really, Discovery needs to hire someone who knows power. Not Discovery, sorry, Star Trek, the whole team between Prodigy and then this. And shields. We don't know how much energy shields take, right? But due to the conservation of energy, I think we could be reasonably confident that a shield has to have the energy of whatever is impacting it to absorb it, right? If you're hitting it with like a one jewel phaser, whatever, I, I'm probably using those units wrong then the the phase, the shield is going to have one jewel of power or watt or whatever. And I use that example because phasers are going to be pretty darn powerful. Ship's phasers, sorry. the Yeah, ship's phasers. And the heat, um, you know, it got the bridge up incredibly hot, hotter than the suit could handle, which we've discussed has got to be far hotter than a sun. So, you know, let's be generous and just say it was the temperature of a sun outside. Um, which actually, thinking about it, not even 31st century material could probably handle. Yeah, let, let's, we're being real generous. This real low high temperature that, you know, whatever the 32nd century material could handle. That's a lot of energy. And that is far less than the amount of energy it takes to keep people alive. If it took that much energy for life support, your heating bill would be insane. <laughs> and again, the life support is not even going to cover, that energy is not even going to cover the like five minutes you wasted sitting on your ass just not moving the ship forward. And final problem as well, they talked about sonar, which yes, assuming there's some point of like the exit of this anomaly that, you know, they, they're bouncing sonar off of, okay? A lot doesn't make sense here. Like, this molecule resonates at a frequency of, what, 218 or something? Well, a resonance frequency is the kind of frequency that's gonna make, like, the molecule oscillate at the same rate as the wave or whatever, right? I, can a molecule have a resonance frequency? I don't actually know. It's kind of like a multiple molecules. But anyway, right? You, you could still use son sonar, I suppose, but you can use sonar for any wavelength. Assuming that wavelength doesn't, like, transfer through the... Sonar sound, isn't it? This is radar. Because radar is sending, like, radio waves that bounce off things. Sonar is sound, and you're in space, so sound doesn't actually work. But I'll let that slide, because it still works under, you know... When they said send a pulse, like, you could still send a, any sort of pulse, you know, a light wave, a 218 nanometers or whatever. But sonar is non-directional. Well, I guess you could make it directional, but the way Discovering is doing it is they have no way what direction their thing is. So they're sending a pulse in all directions, and then they're gonna listen to which pulse comes back. Sorry, not which pulse, but which direction the pulse comes back. Now, actually, you can get direction if you have multiple sensors. Um, four? I think you'd need four in three-dimensional space, at least four sensors 
at different parts of the ship, and then you could register the time delay and get direction from that way. I doubt Discovery actually has um, that because... Well, okay, no, may maybe it right. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt because, as you've seen, there's so many more problems with this. But I was going to say then, if you only had the one, they're not moving, so they couldn't actually get direction from that. Uh, which actually brings me back to one of my fundamental problems is when the, the whole problem is they can't go back, right? They can't travel backwards. Well, you flew forwards to get here, right? Can you just reverse? And all right, it was a bumpy ride. Like, I don't think it was bumpy enough to literally flip Discovery on its head. Like, you could probably still reverse. We saw the bumps. It was jittering. Like, in general, you could reverse, be fine. But let's just say you can't, and it completely turned them around. Zora doesn't have enough information to extrapolate a path backwards. Here's what Zora knows. Zora knows their speed and heading at all times, right? Due to the inertial dampeners and the fact we could see the crew jostling, Zora has to know the amount of energy the inertial dampeners put to counteract that and all the movements of the ship. I don't see how you couldn't know that is Zora. Now, Zora can add these two pieces of information, the distance traveled through this, the speed, the heading, and by the way, we know that all of these are kept track of due to, again, that season two, the next generation episode with Nagim and countless other examples. You can add all that up to get a complete flight path Discovery took and then just go backwards. The average jet could probably do that. In fact, speaking of that Nagim episode or whatever it was, one thing they tried was placing a beacon down, a stationary beacon. Could Discovery use something like that to help them navigate? They didn't even try that. It's a season one episode next generation. Like, I was enjoyable enough, it's clearly not perfect, but I'm also not, it's not like watching Chibnall's Doctor Who. You know, I'm, for the most part, entertained. There are these constant minor problems, but it, admittedly, they are minor problems. Like, that. that's what it is. It's, I'm never really going to go back and watch any of these individual episodes, but when I eventually watch through Star Trek with my partner, I'm going to hate, actively hate, and get angry at seasons one and two of Discovery. Season four Discovery, I'm not going to get angry at. I'm going to, we're going to sit there, enjoy it, and kind of laugh at all these problems. I think what always gets me is that I'm not a writer. I should never be able to watch something and think I can do better. And I cannot do better than this from scratch. But in the writer's room, right? If you sat me down in the writer's room, yeah, I can do better than this because all the other writers are going to come forward with this. I'm going to point out these small gripes, as I've done in these videos. I'm going to point out simple one-liners you can use to fix them. Then you end up with a final product that has less problems. I remember reading once or hearing once someone saying that's, like, as a writer perspective, that's not really the point. Is the point is you're trying to tell a good story. I'll concede that, like, yeah, there's that. But I'll also uphold that there's no real reason you shouldn't be able to tell a good story that isn't also cohesive. Uh, well, not, not necessarily cohesive, but without these tiny little problems. Not a perfect story. You know, maybe one or two little problems. But, you know, it, it should be a really well put together cohesive story. And there's a sci-fi story famous for it. I can't remember what it is. But... The way it was written, where the author basically wrote out the story, kind of the general plotline, but also the story, like, is the actual writing the words. He would send it off to his reviewer. And the reviewer's job was specifically to, like, highlight all the problems, basically doing exactly what I'm doing, and solve the plot instantly. And he's like, look, this literally solves the plot from, like, page 10. And he'd give that back to the author. And then the author would restructure the problem to fix that solution. And basically, this would go back and forth until eventually the editor was like, I've got nothing. Like, yeah, you know, this this works. And so the end result is a very cohesive sci-fi with, like, no plot holes. And everything makes sense and is logical and the cast figure it out in a sensible way, as you'd expect. Not necessarily as you'd expect, like there could be still be surprises and stuff, but it doesn't have these constant little problems. 
And I'm not saying that, like, that's how everything has to be written, but I'm also gonna say that plenty of shows and plenty of Star Treks, literally every good show ever, has managed to produce products that don't have these constant little problems. That's what makes them great shows. And so there are ways to do it. And it's frustrating when someone who's not a writer like me could have been not shown this story, but, you know, told this story in the writer's room or in the script writing, or script editing, and every single thing that had to happen in order to get to this point. Even an actor could voice up and say, hey, this one line fixes this small problem. Not for everything, of course, but, you know, there are some things that can be fixed by an actor saying, hey, can I add this, like, one line, you know, fix this little problem? It's frustrating because I always feel all of, or some of the people in that process whose job it is to actually, like, write these stories and do this stuff, should have done it. I'll say, as not a writer, there's only ever been one thing, writing-wise, that I've actually gone, I could have done better from scratch. And yes, that's Chris Chibnall's Doctor Who, but, um, like, that's the low, low, low bar. This is just competent writing that tells a decent story, just with loads of little problems. I have no idea what the modern Doctor Who Star Trek crossover is, let alone in my videos. But I'm not going to stop talking about it. We'll end it on a positive, shall we? Real small thing, but I enjoy that um, Discovery is being repaired at Archer Space Dock. I wonder how it got there, thinking about it. I don't know if it could jump or warp or maybe be tugged or whatever. But, you know, you set up Archer Space Dock, you're like, hey, you know, we've built this brand new space dock. It's like state of the art, yada yada. So yeah, that's where Discovery is being built. Just a little bit of world building. That's nice to see. And with that, I'm glad you made it this far. You know, all the ranting and anger and everything. Really, I, I did enjoy this episode more than it, more than it seems, which is something I say a lot. I wish I didn't have to, but I've talked plenty of times about how complaints just take up the runtime way more than, yeah, I liked it. My upload speed would be happy if all I had to say was, yeah, I liked it. I'm still good for one more week. Uh, these videos might get a bit sketchy for a lot of things. I'll talk about it in the next review. I still plan on doing them, but university, a lot of stuff. I'll just talk about it next time and look for announcements. Follow me on Twitter, which isn't something I say a lot, but if you want updates on the channel and stuff, as well as just some random things, um, in my description, there's a link to my Twitter. Twitter gets all the updates for even, like, these videos take ages to upload. Even, like, when this video is expected to be done processing. Yeah, if you want updates, go there. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time for episode 7, also unnamed on Memory Alpha before I started recording.